everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Another round of applause for our amazing panel. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kai Savas. I'm the founder of Film Music Media. I'm a uh, film music journalist and uh, work in animation, and so it's uh, an honor to sit with everybody here. And uh, so let's uh, jump into it. So we want, I want to focus our first uh, question. is going to go over to uh, Kate and, and Greg. So uh, to kick things off, you know, I love to hear about each duo's kind of collaboration, and we all work in this collaborative environment. So we're dealing with duos from different departments, and I'm interested to, I guess, uh, to see how you guys approach your collaborative process on the projects that we just saw, you know, a few minutes ago. So when you're working on stuff like Pupstruction and Tots, how do you two decide, you know, uh, when to use music versus sound effects to evoke specific emotions and enhance certain scenes, atmospheres, and how do you guess you start your collaborative process working together? Yeah. Uh, th thanks, <laughs> thanks everybody for being here, and yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about about that question is how Kate and I, um, like on on this show, um, there's another half of my team on the music side, and his name is Rob Cantor, and he does all the songs. And we met in college, so we have a you know a natural rapport. We've been friends for like ten years now. But but Kate, we the first time we met was basically in a mix, right? I mean, we were thrown together, yeah. um, like just two people, like. You both know your jobs, make something really great, do it collaboratively, right? And so we're, we, we didn't know each other at first, but we had to kind of approach it yeah. with, 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 with respect and, and, and be open-minded about stuff, right? And so that, mm -hmm. was, that was sort of a, a difference in the way that we collaborate versus maybe somebody like me and Rob. And, uh, and luckily it worked out, right? We, yeah. I think we have a really good rapport <laughs> now. We've done three, three series together. And, yeah, but yeah. we weren't starting our work by collaborating and, right. and pre-gaming how we were going to approach. We had already done our respective parts of the job and were brought together to see how it would all work together. Yeah, yeah. it's all at the end and it can be very time, set, time crunched at the mix because, you know, usually there's a set amount of time and like there's usually a deadline of when the film's going to be coming out looming and so everyone's trying to get like the final tweaks made and, uh, and so, so, and so it has to move fast but also um, you want to get your ideas in like especially with music and sound coming together for the first time, what are some like really effective tweaks we can make, right, to, to help, help them both have their moments, you know, so you don't have everything stepping on each other. Yeah, how do you decide, I'm curious how you guys decide that, because, you know, you can get a, like a comedic, really kind of com com uh, comedy, like punch, a punchline with sound or a sound effect or something, or a musical cue or a sting or something. How do you decide what's right for that moment or scene or one that kind of, jumps out that's kind of obvious or do you have to see like let's try it with just a little sound effect maybe we need a little like a little music cue I'm curious well we're both trying to keep it in mind as we're working separately of what would possibly be mm -hmm. a featured music moment or a sound effect moment I feel like Greg is really good at sort of thinking about like oh there's probably going to be an elevator ding right in this one moment and so he'll leave space for mm -hmm. it we'll cut the ding on our <laughs> end right but then when we get to the mix it's the first time that everybody in the room is hearing those things together right. so a lot of times we'll make little tweaks like we put it on the beat of the music so it felt almost like the little cherry on top of a mm -hmm. big long musical moment so yeah. those are the kind of things that we do yeah. and you know I'm the first pass sort of of I'm the first person who gets to see everything all together and I'm by myself during that during the premix and um, so I'm always just trying to think like what is happening in this scene that's important but also like what is this shot for right, you know what's right. the director trying to achieve with this moment because they've painstakingly storyboarded it right yeah 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 and so um, it's just a matter then of to wading through all the stuff that everybody has applied, which is fantastic, but if you put it all together, you wouldn't be able to focus if you're the audience. So I'm thinking, how do I focus, especially these two to six year old kids who are gonna watch it? Right. And then I'm choosing the sonic element, whether it's score, or sound effects, or Foley, um, to sort of give clarity in that particular moment. Absolutely, and you mentioned you know your younger viewers, your younger mm -hmm. audience, so I'm curious how that affects your workflow or approach. You know, I've been doing a lot of uh, panels with uh, kind of people who work kind of in the children's an animation and family programming and stuff like that and I think the consensus is that you don't talk down to kids you don't treat them any lesser than anybody else they have their emotions are valid so I'm curious but how do you tweak or affect you know how does the sound how does your approach to sound effect sound or music kind of affect for a younger audience and how does that play into your workflow oh, we did. Yeah, yeah you had some thoughts yeah. on this kind of yeah you know definitely don't want to talk down to kids um, and so I make sure that the music I'm writing is the same kind of music I'd be writing if it was a Pixar movie, for the most part. But where that might be an exception to that is I do try to keep in mind, and this is something that one of the executives I, I started working with, Lori Mazzillo, um, really stressed to me when I started working for Disney, was that, you know, 
any opportunity we can take to help younger kids understand the story, we should we should do it. And so if that's you know if that's me doing a little stinger or a musical chime when uh, there's an important plot point or writing a little like xylophone doohickey when there's a joke just so kids know like that's supposed to be a funny line right like that that that's that's i don't i don't know if it's talking down at least it's, it's at least just giving them a helping hand so sure. that they can especially really young kids start to understand like what, preschool programming yeah. is completely different yeah. also than yeah it's usually like what it's up to six and then six to eleven is a different kind of demographic right. yeah yeah, yeah. Right. and i find too that in the just the amount of music like i'm always boggled by how much greg can achieve in like a two-week period <laughs> but there's just 22 minutes of music yeah. and the idea sort of being that if you let the energy down at any point in time the kids might just walk away because they got bored and I think that the so it's how do you still do a good job if right. that's the scenario not just within the time crunch but how do you keep 22 minutes of good music sure. going that's engaging and, and Greg always does a great job of it but it does mean sometimes that we weave yeah. up and down a lot more than you would normally with less material to work with absolutely yeah yeah well, that's, I mean, it, it showed on screen, like, I mean, just the world coming to life, all the colors that sound and music can add to just not just the picture, but I mean, just the whole emotion, the emotional spectrum of everything. So yeah, congratulations. It's just amazing work you guys do. So um, I do want to jump over to uh, Sean. So Sean, um, let's take it over to you, uh, to Sean and Andreas to talk about their um, comedy film Camp Hideout, which congratulations on getting the film out. I mean, amazing to see like kind of that throwback feel to the stuff that we grew up on, kind of that kind of nice you know, family comedy of, you know, I mean, stuff that we all grew up watching and stuff like that like heavyweights is one of my favorite i think that's like you know <laughs> but um but sean how does your unique position as being both director and editor kind of lend you the opportunity to you know fine-tune comedic moments and ensure they kind of land as intended uh, all right when you're on set directing are you already thinking about the edit or is that complete part of your brain completely shut off until you get into the editing room <laughs> no i'm always uh i'm always thinking about the edit mm -hmm. as i'm shooting um, I'm always thinking about all the small pieces that you need in order to tell that specific story. And, um, you know, it all, like with comedy and, and anything, it all comes down to the script. Yeah. If the script has those comedic, comedic moments, then it's my job to find a way to bring those out. And, you know, it's not just um, in how we shoot it and how we act it, but it's in the props. It's in all the departments, the wardrobe, everything that... Um, that comes to make it funny. So like in our film, um, some of the wardrobe options um, were a little silly and a little off, but yeah. they were all done to serve this like greater story. Like some of the props, for instance, like Christopher Lloyd has like these long binoculars and I, I was in a screening, I didn't even think it was a funny moment and people were laughing at the binoculars for how long. And I mean, we just picked the ones that we thought were like a little bit more ridiculous and odd. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when we're filming like an action sequence, like in this specific movie, I had a really good um, stunt team uh, led by Jennifer Badger. And so she, um, we would talk through how we would do these like, um, you know, Home Alone style stunts. And we would talk about how, you know, they would slip and they would slide and we'd walk through it. And then she would go and she would film it with her stunt people. And um, her stunt performers would give us different options that we weren't even expecting because we didn't know that their bodies could do what <laughs> yeah. they could do. And everything in the movie is the stunt people doing their jobs. There's no like CGI or wire work or anything like that. So everything is practical. And so she would send it to us and then we'd look at it and then like as, a, as, you know, as an audience member and as the director, I'm watching it and I'm like, this is funny, this is not, this is really right. funny. And so, we cherry picked those moments and then we filmed the entire sequence and then once you get into editing sometimes things that were funny on set weren't as funny as you know in the edit yeah and then sometimes you become numb to it because you've seen it so many times and so i have a 10 and 12 year old and usually they're my first test audience focus group, i'll show yeah. it to them and i'll, and I'll say is this funny or not because they're very very honest right and um <laughs> And they'll tell me like, no, that's that that's cringe, Dad, or whatever. <laughs> no. I use that word all the time. Um, but um, but we found a way, um, and and I've done other movies with Andreas uh, that are in that family um, friendly zone. That um, and what kids really respond to, at least that we have found, is the visual humor. Anything yeah, that visual you can do visually, yeah. they're not as much with like the talking. I mean, the jokes and stuff will work with them, but the visual humor is what gets them the most. So like that last shot that you saw where 
uh, the paintball, you know, that I saw that in the theater a couple times and that was like the biggest laugh for everybody. So, yeah, I mean, it's funny how it, you're talking about cherry picking, too, because, it, you know, fall, you can turn kind of almost violence, but com comedic violence, you know, falling down can be very tragic and hurt, but you yeah. can be comical and funny, too. And you have to find that line of what's kind of light and fun and nobody's getting hurt, but still just kind of comedic and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and a lot of that comes down to the performers, too. Yeah. Right? Like the performers acting that they're they're just a little bit. <laughs> larger than life in right. a lot of those scenes so you yeah. know that a little bit cartoony kind yeah, of like Looney yeah. Tunes type stuff yeah, yeah yeah but I want to jump over to Andrea so to piggyback off of you know Sean what Sean was mm -hmm. talking about you know sound is such a huge part of, of comedy such a huge part of, of you know especially family comedy so how did you kind of approach Camp Hideout to ensure the sound enhanced kind of those comedic elements um, well there were certainly many considerations and one of them was um, trying to use some restraint because there was a lot of temptation to go too big. Yeah. And so we didn't want, we didn't want to uh, exploit it. We didn't want to, um, um, let's see, um, use sounds that we hadn't earned in terms of story and in terms of um, comedic um, action. And luckily there were, um, there were some very uh, active, uh, let's say action sequences, especially towards the end, where we really had opportunities to, to go big. And so we used restraint in the sense that um, there were a lot of things happening oh. at the same time. And in, instead of, making sure that we could hear everything, we would focus like, okay, in this shot, this is happening, in this shot, this is happening. So we would always choose one sound that was like the protagonist for this moment, and then in the next shot, and so and so. And so um, that's the way that we made things sound actually big, because yeah. it was almost like helping the eye focus with sound. Because you would see five things happening, but if we focus on one thing sonically, then that's where the eye goes. So there was, there was uh, one scene, for example, when these bad guys are getting bombarded with uh, water balloons. And if we were to add sound for every single water balloon, they would just hear a flurry <laughs> and it would sound like a blur, like it would sound like noise. So we, we were very careful about choosing which ones to emphasize so we would get the idea of what was happening and really feel the impact of those yeah. moments. So we had to, yeah, we have to be very selective about that. So, and are you working really close with Sean during the edit to be like there while he's th coming together? And Sean, how while do you like While Sean is conform? editing, I let him do this, his thing. Um, yes, because I know that once we have picture lock or as close as picture. <laughs> <laughs> if there is such a thing nowadays, um, I know there would be a lot of <clears throat> back and forth. Um, but we experimented. We experimented quite a bit, and we had a lot of fun with the sounds. And uh, we uh, we wanted to make everything sound like realistic, yeah. but also having fun with it. Mm -hmm. So if you hear, if you see the bad guys. Uh, slipping and falling in the mud, you're hearing jello and water <laughs> and uh, a lot mm -hmm. of other unmentionable sounds that were there. Um, <laughs> but just to emphasize the comedy that was already there on screen. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We didn't elevate it to a, a crazy level where well, we almost we, did, though. We yeah. almost did, yeah. but we, we pulled back. Like, oh, we didn't have yeah. like the Tweety Bird sound when they're No, nope, we didn't do that. We didn't do anything like that. We didn't. <laughs> we were going to do the Wilhelm scream. That was like one thing that we thought about. <sighs> But we pulled that out at this the This might last be the only movie where we didn't use the word. <laughs> <laughs> I was just catching up on Righteous Gemstones last night, and they used it. And I was like, oh, there it is. Like, it just still pops up everywhere. <laughs> so, I heard yeah. it in the Barbie movie. Oh, yeah, it was in the Barbie movie. Yeah, yeah. 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 Once. Yeah. 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 It was three <laughs> times in the new Indiana Jones. Of course. I, yeah, uh, on the train. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, what, like to, to add to what um, Greg and Kate said is, like, we really have the conversation about where music is going to be in the forefront of the right. scene and where sound is going to be in the forefront. And so in the movies that we've done in the past, we, you know, usually in the mix or even before the mix, we'll have a conversation. And um, I've worked with the, you know, sound and music. I've, ha I've worked with um, composer Jason Brandt. Jason is great, yeah. A lot of the, the scores that we've done. And so there's always that combination of a, you know, where the two of them talk and they talk yeah. about, Frequencies and right frequencies mm -hmm. and levels and, and that to to see who so they don't compete. Entirely. I know yeah. I, I discovered that recent. I mean not recently, but when I started doing composer interviews, it's like yeah you can't you you can't compete with the sound effects. So certain tones or frequencies, especially with action like big yeah. Marvel movies, like I'm yeah. talking to Brian Tyler and he's like you can't explosions. That's usually when it's time for me to dip down. I can kind of move around them and stuff like that. But it's such an interesting yeah. balance of trying to find that, like especially with sound. You should um, your, your sound wants to emphasize the action and yeah. the music wants to emphasize the reaction. Right, that's yeah, that's perfectly put, absolutely. Um, so let's jump over to, uh, to Jare and Pancho. So Jare <laughs> and Pancho, you two have a long history of uh, working together on several projects. Uh, so when working on projects that target both Chinese and international audiences, how do you strike a balance between maintaining you know, cultural authenticity and catering to a global audience? You kind of want to make it personal and reflective of 
what the story you're telling, but also to be able to be accessible to everyone else. So I'm curious, um, Jare, if you want to start to speak from the kind of producer standpoint of that. Oh, yeah. So uh, as a producer who's originally from China, uh, uh, lots of Chinese production, they um, normally don't hire like foreign J composer because they always saying, oh, because like some uh, traditional instrument, you don't know, they don't uh, like American produ uh, composer, they might don't know how to use them and mm -hmm. how to like score that. But obviously it's not a good composer, always like good at any instrument. Yeah, yeah it's like music is like, there's a kind of like their own language is no based on their it's like a universal cultural language. language. Yeah, yeah, it's a universal language. Yeah, the, universal yeah. language. Yes. So um, my director, the first uh, feature film we work together is called Rusty Blade. Uh, is a Chinese director, and he even doesn't speak English. But we end up like we want to hire the post team in U.S. because you guys always deliver high quality uh, <laughs> post production jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I reach out to Pancho and they end up like working really good. There's a, some like communication issues in between, like the cultural gap, like uh, language gap. But they kind of like uh, solve that because um, they like uh, for for example, there's a, a opening saying that Pancho did a really gorgeous orchestration uh, score for mm -hmm, it. Yeah. It's more towards like a US style. And uh, the director wants to have like Chinese traditional instrument in, in there. So Pancho just studied it by, by himself and wow. deliver a, a gorgeous music. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Pancho, talk to us about from your perspective as a composer. Oh, when I, you're... Want, I want to clarify. <laughs> she, she says, you know, there was miscommunication, but we worked it out. We worked it out because of her. <laughs> <laughs> she she is the UN of producers and sort of made sure that um Anyway, that, yeah. that that we iron whatever. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Even when the communication, when it's all the same language, producers are the UN when it comes to the kind of balancing oh things God. out. So I'm curious, but from your perspective as the composer, and you're tackling maybe something that's new to you or foreign to you, and you need to kind of make it true to the story, but also you know you're trying to put your voice into it and maybe you need to use certain cultural instruments. I'm curious from your perspective as a composer, how do you approach all that? There's like a learning curve yeah. for some of it. <laughs> sure, yeah. And uh, um, I, th I think, you know, keep keeping a, a, an open mind and, and, and doing your research on on styles and, and, and instrumentation that I might not be familiar with. And I, I knew a little bit of Chinese uh, about traditional Chinese music. Jerry and I have worked on several projects. You mentioned in this one, but this has happened where I had to like imitate a Chinese opera. Like I was like, <laughs> I've heard Chinese opera before, but I have no clue how to write one. And it was in a different project. And so things like that, or, or the example that she says where, where I wrote something that felt true to me, which is the best, every time you compose anything, or at least the way I see it is, you try to be as truthful as you can to the story that is presented, how it serves the, the, the film, right? And and in that particular case, I, I did that, and then, like she mentioned, the director was like, yeah, that's nice, but mm -hmm. we're going to change, we're going to do a, a 180 and, and try something a little bit more traditional, and, and in all fairness to the director, he let me try, right? It, it's, it's good to have a director that, um, mm -hmm. that is going to let you sort of give me your best shot, and then I'll, I'll sort of guide you through that, and that's what you want from a director, really, to, to that collaboration, to yeah. give you the room to, to sort of work, and then tell you if you're hitting the base or not, right. emotionally or yeah. not. Uh, it's, it, there's, there's so many ways you can interpret a scene or, or a film, right? And, and in, in that particular case, he didn't speak not one word of English. And I don't speak Chinese. And so yeah. she had to literally uh, sort of, you know, sort of balance, do a balancing act between, nobody was losing their nerves or anything like that. It was right. all very friendly. Right. but. But there was definitely a, a, a cultural difference on how they were approaching things, on, on how there was one moment where I got, you know, very educated on percussion instruments. The, uh, one of the music supervisors on the film mm. is an actual percussionist in China. Wow. And so he sent me some samples of, of, of traditional patterns that, you know, y y when you do world music, especially in, in Hollywood, we do an interpretation of whatever we think that's sure. going to be like. And mm -hmm. in many cases, I'm from Spain and I hear things that, are supposed to be from Spain. And I was like, it's a hybrid, you know, of things. It's never completely culturally accurate in, in most cases, right? And that's fine. You take your dramatic liberties. Uh, but in this particular case, they were 
you know, they, they were guiding me. And it was, it was really eye-opening. And, and you have to come in with an open mind and not be like, well, my music is, you know. Yeah. You can't fall, you <laughs> can't fall in love with your music. Oh, and, yeah. But, and yeah. film, uh, to start with, you can't I fall in love. I think with any role, you can't fall in love with whatever you're, it's not about you, it's about the, the story. The story. Yeah. It's, so you serve the film the best you can. Be yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if I'm not understanding, then the director did a great job in Chinese to explain to me what, what the story really needed and, yeah. and how to get there. And then you open your mind to that and you research and you, you know, it's a very practical, hands-on thing. It's like, how do I... I, I didn't grab my, I didn't grab the instrument, but I went and looked videos and then look for the samples and then just try to sort of do that and then I'm collab collaborating with the percussionist to do some other patterns and you know it it takes a village. Yeah, it does. Right? It really yeah. does, and it's um, especially when there is that kind of no, not direct communication. And Jare, you have to. I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, balancing that. Um, how do you how do you do it? I guess in a sensitive way that makes sure that everyone is. Be felt heard and do you feel does it put pressure on you to make sure everyone is communicating like as a yeah. producer I'm yeah, sure. yeah yeah for me uh the biggest di difference i feel like for someone like a director i work with they consider it like a uh, sound design or composer as one of the crew mm -hmm. but to be honest like all those like those positions they are considered as artists sometimes you need to trust their instinct in order yeah. to put your mind on top of them yeah. yeah, because everyone is served for the picture, not for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. so lots of like a director, they sort of understand, but they still like think, oh, this is my own piece. Mm -hmm. I need to protect my own creativity. So sometimes they don't see that thing. And then as producer, like sometimes I don't want to be harsh, but that sometimes, most of the time, I have to point it out. If yeah. I really think that piece, oh, the composer's point is actually works better for the picture than yours then i have to point it out yeah mm -hmm. wow. yeah yeah so. producer like definitely is hard job i'm i'm considering myself as more of like a chain of communication between all the departments yeah yeah instead of like i will let the created people to deliver their best job and pick the right picture to serve the picture and tell the story yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's not like who's better than who's it's the whoever served the Pictures best. Yeah, but I recently talked with Gore Verbinski recently for some liner notes, and he he's like, once the movie kind of takes an edit, it start of it becomes something you don't expect, and it starts speaking to you, and you have to listen to it. It's like it will tell you what it needs, and then you kind of feed it what it yeah. needs and see what it works. So, but you mentioned a great thing about communication and, and direct lines of communication. So we have you know three comp uh, or three creative duos here that kind of work together. So I'm curious if we could go b between the duos and explain what your i guess what your line of communication is during production like do you guys work separately and then come together at certain points or are you continuously working back and forth or do you kind of stay separate and let the feedback come from from a director or producer so i'm curious like how you two work and at what points do you guys speak and go back into your little worlds and and do separate things so if you want greg and kate want to take us off yeah. sure yeah well i think we're pretty separate until i'm yeah. freaked out about something <laughs> 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 and i email kate and i'm like hey <laughs> Uh, and you know, I don't know, but it's, you know, in animation, I feel like there are certain, it's such a big machine and there's so many people involved and there could be multiple countries even, people animating project that certain issues, if they don't get caught at the right time in the production process, they won't, they can't be fixed. It would cause too much backtracking, right? And so mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. we run into something where I'm like, that's not going to, like, how are we going to, how are we going to like make music work the, around the that? pony story. I the suggested story. telling this story <laughs> and Greg said he maybe still has PTSD <laughs> okay. from this. <laughs> yeah, but, well, PTSD stories, yeah, great. funny <laughs> for everyone else except for Greg. So. Story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was this uh, episode in When We Worked on Tots, yeah. which was a Disney Junior show, and they had a tap dancing pony, and so the animators, the whole episode, the whole episode <laughs> just in and out, every other shot is cutting back to this pony, and um, they had tempted in these like 1950s um, tap dancing sound effects into the edit just to sort of convey yeah. like into the animatic which is the storyboard set um, to time and they had and then they shipped that overseas and the idea had been this will let them know that the pony's tap dancing because it's just stills right but they actually animated to the exact temp effects in every moment um, which I guess makes sense in hindsight, but nobody thought about the fact that tap dancing is actually just a percussion instrument that yeah, goes yeah. with the music, right? Yeah. So then Greg all of a sudden had to backtrack from these like weird samples and create an entire underscore that like fit those rhythms and also somehow was going to magically match the sound effects that we cut in and then everybody was going to see for only four hours on the stage one time. 
So he yeah. sent me a panicked email and was like, I think we need to coordinate on this. And we did, which was yeah. uh, the right thing to do because it came together well and sure. it was not an emergency and nobody saw our internal freak out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you anticipate problems like that. And then like on the mix itself, it's just like picking your battles, right? Because like yeah. I was saying earlier, time is always limited. Maybe you'll have four hours. Where to, yeah. to review everything, and, and I may have three things I want to say. I'll pick the one I really feel strongly about, and I'll present it in a way that's as an option. I don't, you know, composers, I think we kind of have a rep of, of for, I, mean, I don't know if we have more of a rep of this than other departments, but I think we're sort of expected to be like, turn the music up here, turn the music up there, which, you know, I do ask for that from time <laughs> to time. But, you know, but I don't, I, I, I also find, I also have moments where I think the music should be brought down, right? Yeah. Where I think mm -hmm. sound should lead something. And I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, I think we can, I think as long as we're all thinking like what's the best for the project, we'll end mm -hmm. up in the right place. But Let's jump over to, to Sean and Andrea. So talk about your line of communication. You kind of touched upon it a little bit. Um, we'll play through the whole movie and we'll talk about certain, you know, areas where we really yeah, yeah. want to emphasize certain sound effects. And I think yeah. Freddy was probably one of the bigger ones that we did, the robot movie yes. that we had done. And we had a ton of sound effects in that. Oh, yes, we did. Yeah. No, but we go way earlier than that because usually when you start, you will send me the screenplay. Yeah. And so while yeah. you're shooting, I'm already reading the screenplay and I'll have like a lot of ideas marinating in my head. So by the time I see picture, I go, Oh, none of my ideas are going to work. Okay, I have to start over. <laughs> but, uh, but it's good to have that, that bit of homework uh, done so we, um, so we can sort out what won't work because that's just as important. Uh, but yeah, we do experiment quite a bit, especially when there's, there are things that could sound like whatever we want, where we have complete freedom. In this case, this robot could, we use sounds of vacuum cleaners, we use synthesizer Moog sounds, mm -hmm. we use human voices, we used a lot of things that it made this, the robot sound the way it sounded, in, in terms of like when it was flying, not even the... And that was something that voice. we had to do early on because yeah. if we waited till the end, and he had done the sound for the robot and got to the end, and I'm like, no, we should change this. It, it <laughs> becomes a domino effect all the way through. Exactly. So on yeah. certain movies, we'll focus in on specific moments and scenes, mm -hmm. and with Freddy, um, because of the, you know, the robot is flying mm -hmm. all throughout the movie and doing yeah. all sorts of maneuvers, mm -hmm. we really, really focused in on, you know, what would it sound like if he's just hovering, or she's mm -hmm. just hovering? What would it sound like if, because um, there's like a medical spray that yeah. she puts out, she shoots lasers, she sh does all sorts of different things. Um, and, and we did a live robot for this. We had a puppeteer, mm -hmm. it was a live um, robot so that the, the kids in the movie could actually interact directly with the robot, which yeah. really, really helped out with performances. But that was something that we, that we had done. And then there was a voiceover aspect as well. Um, and so we had a temp voice and we had, there was a big debate for a while about who would do the voice. Mm -hmm. So we had a female voice, then we had a male voice, and so we did multiple, multiple takes of the cast saying he or she, okay. and then we ended up with Candace Cameron Bure mm -hmm. to do the voice. But with that too, there was, there's always that timing thing where if the voiceover is longer than the temp voice. Yeah. Like we worked really hard to kind of keep it the same, but sometimes we'd had to either space it out or we'd have to go back in the edit and We tighten. edited some lines as well. But we also had some, let's say, um, there were some creative slash philosophical discussions about the sounds of Freddy where we talked about whether it was a, um, whether it was a, you know, gender, male or female, but we also spoke about like, what does Fred represent? Is this a friend of James? Is this, James mm -hmm. doesn't have a mom. So, okay, is Freddie replacing his mom in some ways? Is he like a, a parental figure? And that would inform us in, some, in terms of what choices we're going to employ for sound design. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. how rough is this robot going to sound? Is it, is it junky? Is it rusty? Is it high tech? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, um, is it like a, right, is yeah. it caring? How delicate are the sounds going to be very smooth or very mechanical? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all those conversations were, were very important.
Mm -hmm. I'm so curious. It makes it sound like, oh, yeah, it's meant to be. But no, there's a lot of thought. Yeah. There's a lot of thought. Be yeah. behind it. Well, and Andreas, I'm curious. Like, I know sometimes, you know, for, I think it's from a composer. A composer might do, like, some demos or a, a suite to kind of get an idea of, like, what the, the, get the building blocks for what the music or the sound or the tone could be. I'm curious from sound effect, found pr uh, perspective, do you create, like, a palette first when you kind of talked about discovering the robot sound? Is there, like, mm -hmm. here's, like, kind of more, yeah, you're talking about this. It's a, here's a rusty kind of group of sounds. Here's more, like, a, a more slick group of sounds. Do you do kind of stuff like that to yeah. start? Is that usually, kind of something? Usually with Sean, she, he will very, have a, usually have a very clear idea of what he wants things to sound like. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I do have to create palettes and we have okay. like our, 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 let's call them sound objects. Okay. Okay, and th they are made of a combination of sounds. So we know what our, limit, what our limits are. Wow, okay. And there are moments when we can go outside of that and, and go really big. But usually we stay within uh, the rules that we set for our But But, our but, our but we always want to have that space to be able to try new things and oh, throw yeah, things that in oh, yeah. and, and, and that. So I think that's mm -hmm. where that's where you find the most interesting thing is like where Andreas comes in with a sound effect that you would never think would go with a robot. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it's just a small little layer in it. But, you know, that on top adding in with other things, mm -hmm. you know, it turns it into something very unique and interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's an awesome, like, hearing your kind of collaborative yeah. process. Um, mm -hmm. Well, Jure and Pancho, I know you kind of talked about the your kind of direct line of communication, but I'm curious in terms of when you're in production and you're not just relying on each other for translating, I'm curious uh, what kind of you are trying to get from each other in terms of how you guys communicate in terms of getting the story and getting everything done together. So I'm curious, at what, how often are you guys talking about the production of the film together from the composer to producer kind of point of view? Oh yeah, so normally for all the other projects we collaborate, I always give Pancho the lock picture mm -hmm. once I have it ready. There's one unique project, it's called Vera. It's a feature film we shot in Miami early this year. Pancho, as a composer, he literally was on set for the almost whole, uh, whole shoot oh, wow. because it's a feature film about ex foster uh, girl who's a genius as, pian as a pianist. Mm. So we need to have the music ready before we shot the movie. And mm -hmm. uh, our lead, uh, her name's Raquel, and she doesn't, do, she doesn't play piano. So Pancho have to taught her to become a pianist in five days. Wow. Yeah, and wow. we have to Good hire week. Uh, piano doubles, uh, two piano doubles for two of our other, one lead and one supporting role. And Pancho was in charge of that. On top of that, he needs to make sure uh, all our actress, the hand position was right. There's a tons of pressure on Pancho. So that one is <laughs> like, that's, I think, is Pancho's first time on set, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a composer. Well, we, the, go, the way it goes is, you know, she calls me and she says, so, you know, you're going to be writing this because I knew that I was going to be writing mm -hmm. it. And, and you're going to write the piano pieces. And uh, th this is the most that we've talked. You know, if, so to answer the question, you know, it's just a shorter answer, really. Yeah. If there's no problems, I don't hear from her right. if it's not a Chinese <laughs> film, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Because she lets the director work with me, and that's it. In the Chinese films, it was, you know, she was the, the link to everything, right? But in this particular case, we, we're doing this, this film that it's in English. And uh, she basically says, jump, and I have to say, how high? And she was like, I don't have the money, and you're the one that knows these pieces, so get on a flight and come to Miami <laughs> and spend on a week and a half teaching these girls that don't know how to play the piano so that it looks right. <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, and, you know, and, and so we, we were basically seeing each other 24 hours a day or 12 hours a day or whatever it was, and, and, uh, and we made it happen. It was, it was really rewarding. I've, I've never done anything like that, and... and uh, we had to sort of teach people to pretend to play and, and not necessarily the pieces, but just, just to look like you're a professional piano player. And, and so there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of technical stuff that I don't necessarily know as a director of what's gonna look good on the camera or not. I just sort of make it happen. And so uh, her, the director, Sergio Visuete, um, and I would, would sit down and sort of look at dailies and say, is that looking right or is that not looking right? And, and what have you, and and in that sense, I, I think as again, she sort of becomes the nurturer of the of the whole thing, right? When Sergio, the director, is going nuts, this is not going to work out, mm -hmm. or when I'm going like, there's no way these girls are learning how to play piano in a week, <laughs> this is going to just fall apart. Yeah. You know, she's the one. You know, literally saying, just make it happen, just make it happen. 
literally two. We she's talking about a couple of doubles that we were trying not to use, and one of them canceled last minute. And she oh, would call man. me and be like, mm, I don't want to hear this. Go find a double somewhere <laughs> in Miami. I don't live in Miami. You know, I don't. I don't know where to find a double. Where am I? And literally last minute, we found it was for a girl. We found a 15-year-old boy that hadn't come into manhood completely on his hands. <laughs> we talked to the mom. The mom didn't know who I was at all. I just got a phone number from someone that knew someone, and I, I contacted the kid directly. He's a 15, I thought he was 18. And so I'm, a, you know, I'm texting with this 15-year-old who I don't know is 15 at that point. And I'm like, hey, we need you for a shoot. Can you come here? It's 100 bucks a day, you know, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, let me, let me talk to my mom. And then the mom gets on the phone and was like, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> and why are you texting my 15-year-old? It, it looked so, it was so sketchy. I had to apologize. And I was like, oh, my God. So she finally came to meet me and, and saw that she thought that this was some sort of like, super sketchy thing like why are you contacting <laughs> oh my God. it was a whole thing but this was all just jerry wow. saying just look for someone just look for someone just look and and the mom loved it we, we became friends on social media she's asking me when is the movie coming out this was so much fun and all that but it's really a, a juggling act of producing and in my case you know again we don't talk on post-production all that much because the director yeah. and i are working but in that particular case it's a great example of mm -hmm her sort of reining me in and reining the director to sort of work towards a common goal of just, you know, every movie is a miracle. Yeah, you know, I, I think the most important part is, uh, as a producer, I come from an independent world, and uh, I always believe in there's nothing impossible. Like, mm -hmm. in all of my movie, I was like, uh, I don't want to say a little bit pushy, but I'm a little bit like, I want people to achieve their best. Yeah. Yeah, and also I always trust whoever I bring on board, I give them, I fully trust because I yeah. trust my instinct, I trust my mm -hmm. choice. Whatever you deliver to me, I think it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I instead think, of saying no, say, well, find the alternative. What's the alternative? There has, yeah. to, be a path, there has to be a path forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in order to make a movie, I always think the most important thing is uh, it's just like a teamwork. Yeah, mm -hmm. everyone needs to think the best of the picture, not the best for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I consider uh, Pancho as a team player all the time because he's always there to solve problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I, I don't, all of the people I work with and Lily, she's my partner, we always have so much problems, <laughs> uh, like doing all the kinds of production, but ever, we complain a little bit and then we go do and find yeah. alternative solution for that thing. Absolutely. And I think that's the best for mm -hmm. like filmmaking. The point, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, mean, I love how you express like how you kind of look for the best in everybody. And and Sean, you kind of mentioned working with all of you know with Jason or Andreas. Like you, you trust these people and everything, and um, you want to bring out the best. So I'm curious, is there a moment from your careers like where somebody did something, whether it's Andreas or Pancho for you, Jure, like that really like change the way you viewed the film or something that kind of made you I'm going to change the decision based on what they're doing or their creative I, I would say with Max Winslow we've talked about yeah. this there was a there was a scene where we were going to do score through the whole scene and um, and Andreas had some really cool sound effects yeah, and sound design music. elements and it was like this eerie like scene where this kid goes into this like kind of like holodeckish world and when he brought in the sound design, I was like, you know, this is way more interesting than than the music yeah, in this particular thing. Yeah. yeah, and so you can tell tell, tell them what the sound. Well, is, no, though. yeah, we I mean, use the sounds of uh, on underwater recordings of uh, um, icebergs breaking, as well as um, ship hulls, and um, and uh, also more Moog synthesizer sounds, and uh, it really sounded like we didn't know where we are. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just way more interesting. It just felt like on yeah, edge, same, yeah. like, yeah. But it was more like a platform for for the scene to take place. It wasn't like we were telling the audience, feel this way or feel this other way. It was more like, pay attention. Something's going to mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. real quick, Jerry, if you want to wrap us up, because we're almost out of time. So we just, uh, we've got, if there's a moment that you remember that Pancho did, where you're like, oh, this kind of changed the way I, I saw everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to mention about, like, uh, there's a couple of shores. Uh, my budget is too tight. And uh, uh, I could not afford Prancho, so Prancho recommend uh, his assistant. And then the director literally called me like every day and complain. <laughs> and so I have to go back to Prancho and ask him to work on this. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. like 
two or three,、yeah. and then I realize I always like、uh, thinking about oh,、uh, if you're a composer, you can kind of do all kinds of music, and then I would like. Maybe there's a talented behind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for for coming out today. It's been such a great honor to sit down with everybody here.、Uh, we're out of time for today, but thank you for all joining us, and thank you to Impact Twenty Four and the Comic Con Museum for putting this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.